Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we just sang Jeremy Camp's song, Sing Power, and we are so grateful that the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in us. Wow, God. Heavenly Father, um, I pray that we might tap into that power a little more often than we do. And so we've asked, Lord, to lead and guide and direct us in this. Lord, I also pray today that you would anoint my tongue to declare the word that you have given to me this morning on um, Paul's letter to the Romans. And we pray, O oh Lord, that every ear that receives it and hears it would receive it in faith. Father, bless this time together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. Last week, we spent a lot of time considering the life of Abram, who is considered the father of many nations. Uh, he is known as the father of many nations, both Jew and non-Jew circumcised or uncircumcised, because he believed that the Lord would make him a great nation. And Sarah, the mother of nations, when he was very old, and she was very old. You know, we don't normally think of 75-year-old women having babies. Or 100-year-old men having children either. But he believed the Lord that the Lord would do it. And the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. His faith in God was credited to him as righteousness before he was circumcised. In fact, he wasn't circumcised until he was 99 years old. And so he walked by faith long before he was circumcised in the flesh. In fact, we learned last week that circumcision is a seal of what God has been doing in a person's life. It's a sign of faith, okay? It's a seal. It is not a work that a person does to gain favor or some kind of relationship with God. No, it's a seal of that relationship. It's a seal. No seal, whatever it may be, is intended to be all that there is. No. Faith is intended to be paired with the seal. Now, of course, we're talking about circumcision and so forth as a seal, but, and, you know, this might rock your boat a little bit here, but similarly, if every single person on planet Earth was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet did not believe in Jesus and their baptism did, would do them no good. Baptism has got to be accompanied by faith. It is faith that saves, not the baptism. It's faith in Jesus Christ that saves. We too have got to walk by faith like Abraham did. Abraham was the father of many nations because he believed that God would make him the father of many nations. Now our faith is not the same as Abraham's in that, you know, he didn't promise us to be the the fathers and the mothers of many nations. No, we, our faith, is in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that's the subject of today's message, the finished work of Jesus Christ. What I want to do today is read actually a section that we're going to cover today in its entirety before I start splitting it up, because once I split it up, it's like stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. Okay? And that just gets to be a little, oof. So we start at Romans 4, verse 25. He, meaning Jesus, who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, 
proven character and proven character hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. That's how far we're going to get today. Well, let's get into some detail. Jesus was delivered over through our transgressions and was raised through our justification. Now, if you care to count in those first two verses, verse 25 and verse 1 and 2, there's a word through four times. God is making it clear how these things come to pass. Jesus was delivered over to the cross through our transgressions. It was our transgressions that put him there, okay? But he was raised through our justification. All right. I just wanted to point that out to you just in case y'all are out there, you know, really going, man, I'm seeing the word through a lot. I did not put those in there. St. Paul did. Okay? So having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained introduction, introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. In other words, we put Jesus on the cross, our sins put Jesus on the cross, God accepted his sacrifice and raised him from the dead. Now faith in what Jesus did Faith in what Jesus did gives us peace with God and introduces us into God's grace. It introduces us into God's grace. This is a grace by which we stand and live for the rest of our lives. Now, you know, sometimes in the Christian church, you know, we get all kinds of different big words and so forth that you, you know, kind of have a hard time understanding. And one of those big words tends to be this one justified or justification. So it's like, oh gosh, what does that really mean? Let me give you a visual on what justified means. Okay, here you have a black piece of paper. Black construction paper. This is what I looked like my sin, with all my sins covering me before I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. Covered in sin. Black, 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 and even blacker than this. But that's the blackest piece of paper I could find. I could go black, okay? I'm wearing black, all right? Black, but, let's see, where's that other piece of paper? Look what he looks, this is what I look like when God looks at me now. Because I have faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, pull the word justified apart and say, God looks at me just if I'd never sinned. Got it? Just if I'd never sinned. It's a blank slate. He looks at me and he sees me pure, washed in the blood of Jesus. Okay? The same thing can be said for you before you came to Jesus. This is what we all look like, covered in sin. Got the visual? And this is what we all look like covered in the blood of Jesus. Our sins, the Isaiah says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. So, isn't that awesome? That's what he sees. Okay? That's what he sees. He doesn't see us covered in sin. He sees us covered in his son. Alright? So having been, having received all of this by faith in Jesus, we rejoice in hope in the glory of God. 
and not also this, not only this, but we also rejoice in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proves proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, when I first started looking at this passage, I was like going, wow, what are you saying, Paul? I was really stumped. We rejoice in hope of our seeing the glory of God. Of our eventual seeing the glory of God. But that's a future thing. That's not now. That's a future thing. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God that we will see one day. The one day is going to be when all of Jesus' enemies are going to be under his feet. That day is coming. And if you can accept this, Jesus' feet is us. Why do I say that? Because we're the body of Christ. Feet don't belong to the head. They belong to the body. In other words, the church, the body of Christ, the ecclesia of God is going to be the ones to put the enemy underneath the feet. I know you're looking at me quizzically going, huh? Ecclesia means the called out ones. See, we have been called out of a broken world. Okay? It's a broken world. When sin entered into the world, it became broken. Nothing we could do could change that. Jesus, however, came and made a big difference here. You know, he came and reconciled us to God. He said to Peter on Mount Hermon, he said, Upon this rock I will build my church, the Greek word is ecclesia, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, see what he says. What is that? Get, get a visual in your head. Get a visual in your head. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. And the rock he's talking about, there's twofold rock. The rock of faith in him. Okay? It's also Mount Hermon. Now why do I say that? Because Mount Hermon is where the watcher angels came down in Genesis 6 and consorted with human women and had children by them. And so Jesus was then back on Mount Hermon. He was saying, I'm going to build my church right here and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. So what you have the picture of is not, uh, is the church, well, it's actually the gates of hell trying to stay shut so that the church can't go into it to release the captives. Okay? Jesus said, I came to set the captives free. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has, you know, he has anointed me to do these things. And one of them was to, you know, to preach good news, to preach the release of captives and the recovery of sight to the blind. So it is that uh, light came in with Jesus. And because light came in with Jesus, he said he's going to build his church. But the church is the body of Christ. Jesus is the head, okay? How much can we do with just a head? I can't do much with my head. I need my body. My feet belong to my body. Okay? Eventually, all the enemies of Jesus will be under his feet. His body. See, the church hasn't quite grasped that yet. But you see, we're working with Jesus in this. It's a partnership. It's a whole body working together. I mean, none of us. My, my, my little finger never goes and says, well, I want to go over here. And goes jumping off my body to go do something over there. No, it's got to have the rest of the body. Jesus has to have the rest of the body doing, his, doing the work he sends us out to do. Okay? If we aren't doing our part, things Things get sidetracked if we're not doing our part. Now you might say, Pastor, but Jesus is God. He can do anything. He doesn't need us. Well, the fact of the matter is true. That's true. But guess what? God has chosen to work through us. 
He does not need us. He has chosen to do it this way. He's chosen to do it this way. And that's really a hard thing to do. I mean, some people, um, I mean, a lot of people understand this, is that it's, a, it's so much easier sometimes to go and do something yourself than try to get a bunch of other people to do it. I mean, look at a committee. All right, you get a bunch of people together, what are they doing? They're talking, oh, gossiping. <laughs> Talking back and forth, gossiping or whatever. Are they really getting a lot of work done? So it's like so much easier just to go and do it yourself. It would be a whole lot easier for God to do it himself. It would be. He wouldn't have all the mess. But he has chosen to work through us. It's his choice. And even though, you know, people mucked it up with sin, he still chooses to work through us. So anyway, um, so rejoicing the whole, in the hope of the glory of God, that's a future thing. Until that glorious day comes, which we know is coming, and actually it's probably coming a lot sooner than most people think, we can also rejoice in our tribulations. And that's when most people go... <sighs> But look at what it says here. We can also rejoice in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. You've got to work through tribulations. That brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. In other words, the troubles of this life will not have the last word if we allow them, they will actually accomplish God's purposed desire in us. Okay? If we allow the tribulations to produce the perseverance, to produce the proven character, to produce the, the hope, what God is doing, he didn't bring the tribulation, okay? What God is doing is he is then using that to prove our character. Okay? If we let it. We could just say, you know, that thing happened to me and I'm so mad at God, I'm never going to talk to him again. Well, you know what we would have just done if we would have that attitude? We would be saying, God, you're not big enough to deal with the stuff in my life and so I'm just, just going to, you know, turn away from you and just do things my way. And so the proven character never happens. And, of course, we'd be far, far worse for it. Verse 6, it, you know, this is the excitement of Romans chapter 5. It says, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If there is ever a reason for us to be thankful to God and breathe a huge sigh of relief, it's this. God did not wait around for us to get our act together before he came to us. No, God did the acting. You see, God was proactive. He had to be proactive. If he were still waiting on us, he'd be still waiting. He'd still be waiting. You know? He'd still be waiting because, you see, there's nothing inside a sinful person in our fallen nature to even desire God, much less seek reconciliation with him. That's how far lost we were. And God knew this, and so he didn't wait on us. He came looking for us. In fact, even before sin entered the world, God had a plan in place. He would, he would bring about a remedy for sin. Now, he would do it, but he would not do it as God. 
he would do it as a man because it was a man that sinned. If he would have done it as God that had been cheating, he did it as a man. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wonderfully amazing. Verse 9, much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Now, I have to admit, I've, I have passed over that little verse. I'm so excited about the justification of God, I forget that God has another side of him, and that's the wrath of God. But, guess what? Because we've been justified by the blood of Jesus, we've now been saved from the wrath of God. And that's a huge, huge thing. That's a great big perk. <laughs> now, someday the wrath of God will be poured out, but it is not going to be poured out upon any person who has put their trust in Jesus. Okay? No, the wrath of God is reserved for all of God's enemies. Trust me, no one wants to be on that list. Unfortunately, there will be many on that list, and someday they're going to see the full fury and feel the full fury of God. It's not going to go well for them, and it is not going to be pretty. Verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son... Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, we spend a lot of times thinking about the death and resurrection of, son, of the Son of God, but not so much necessarily about the life of Jesus Christ after his resurrection. But this verse points to his life after his resurrection, and it says, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? Not only did Jesus die for us, he lives for us. His death was a one-time event, but his resurrection life is ongoing. But how are we saved by his life? We know how we're saved by his death. How are we saved by his life? Well, here's one way. He is ready to plead our case before the Father should charges be brought up against us by the enemy. Paul states it this way in Romans 8. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Verse 11. Not only this, but we exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. What does that mean? Well, let's think about it. What do you think it would be like for us to meet God face to face had Jesus not been sacrificed on the cross for us? And had, Jesus, and had God not accepted his sacrifice? It would have been terrible. It would have been terrible. If Jesus wouldn't have suffered and died for us, we would have had him been standing before the judge of all the earth covered in our own sin with no advocate to stand beside us. That's bad. We would have had no hope. This would have been just plain scary. But now that Jesus suffered, died, and rose again, for us, the prospect of standing before God is filled with joy, not dread. You see, we aren't going to be standing there before an angry God. We're going to be standing before God who loves us with an eternal love and the one who gave his only begotten son to the cross for us. And the son of God is going to be standing next to us and saying, this one belongs to me. What a relief. There's such good news in this. And it is good news. But you know this good news has got to be shared. It's got to be shared. There, um, there's an entire world, billions still, billions who are headed toward hell right now if we don't share the love of God with them and what Jesus has done for them through the cross and the grave and the resurrection. Billions. 
And you would think by now we have gotten the message that yes, we're supposed to share the message of Jesus Christ with other people. But just this week I received a letter from George Barna. You know, he likes to do research projects and take all kinds of polls and things like this. And he writes this. The holidays are a time when many people are more attuned to religion and Christians are more prone to sharing the gospel with non-believers. Or are they? That note of doubt arises from new research released by the American Culture and Family Institute showing that surprisingly few adults, including born-again Christians, feel a personal responsibility to share their religious beliefs with non-believers. If Barna's research results are accurate, then Christians are not being obedient to the command to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything the Lord Jesus taught those first disciples. My prayer is not only would we take you know, everything in this message to heart, but also the command of Jesus to take this good news to the world around us. I mean, the church is wherever we are. The church is where you are. I'm not where you are. You're not where I am. The church is where you are. So take the good news of Jesus Christ where you are and let people know when you have an opportunity, where you have an opportunity. It could be the grocery store. It could be walking down the street. Let people know that this Jesus is the Son of God. He is the hope of the world. He did die for all people for all time. He is the Savior. The world needs to hear this good news. We just can't keep it to ourselves. Amen.